Shorter and welcome back to Wellywood Wargaming. My name's Damon and I'm here to talk to you about Necromunda. In this episode I'm going to be talking about campaign play. We're taking it right back to basics here and I'm going to be describing the different types of campaigns and how you might go about playing a campaign and setting one up with your buddies. Let's get into it. So starting off then, if you're going to get into a Necromunda campaign, the first thing you're going to need to do is founding a gang. So if you're going to be playing a campaign that involves around the Ash Wastes, you're going to get 1,400 credits to buy your starting gang and vehicles. However, if you're not playing with Ash Wastes rules or vehicles, then you will get 1,000 credits to spend on your gang and all the equipment that's needed for that gang. Gang composition. So, all gangs follow these rules when founded and when new fighters are added to the gang. First of all, you must have a leader. You always, always, always have to start with a leader or a fighter that's got the leader special rules. At least half the gang must consist of other gang fighters. So these can be either gangers and ganger specialists, juves and juve prospects, and also crew. Each gang can have a maximum one house brute as well. Gang fighter balance. If at any time more than half of the gang's fighters are not gang fighter, the gang must take actions to restore the balance. Retire fighters without the gang fighter ability, and also recruit fighters with the gang fighter ability. Continue to take these actions until balance is restored. At least half the gang consists of gang fighters. All gangs can purchase new weapons and equipment from the equipment list, trading post, or black market. However, some fighter types can't take weapons or can only take weapons from the equipment list. Weapons and war gear. A fighter can be equipped with a maximum of three weapon slots, unless noted otherwise. Unwieldy weapons and weapons marked with an asterisk take two weapon slots, typically. Any fighter can be equipped with war gear, equipment, armor, and grenades, unless specifically stated otherwise in that fighter's profile. Faction fighters. The following are considered a faction fighter. Leaders, champions, gangers, juves, including any specialist variants like prospects. Hangers-on, including brutes and hired guns with a gang-specific discount or ability. Any other fighters like pets and universally available hired guns are not considered faction fighters. Each alliance is their own separate faction. Now for a few rules around the different types of fighters that you can have in your gangs. First off, leaders. Leaders start with something called group activation two, as described in my previous sort of guide to Necromunda how to play video. Um, their leading by example is usually 12 inches as opposed to a champion 6 inches, but we'll get into that another time. They can perform post-battle actions. Your leaders can perform post-battle actions like going to the trading post or going to the dock, things like that. Um, and they start with one free primary skill. Every leader starts with one free primary skill. They can't voluntarily retire and they can have multiple equipment sets as well. They must be replaced if killed, see loss of a leader, we're going to talk about that in a bit. And they can equip items from the trading post and black market as normal. The next type is a champion. Champions are slightly different from leaders, they're kind of like the lieutenants in the gang. Um, but they have group activation 1 as opposed to your leader, and their bubble is a 6 inch leading by example, um, as we mentioned before, but we won't get into the specifics of that just yet. They can also perform post battle actions like going to the trading post, working territory, things like that. Um, they start with one free skill as well, always, always a primary skill. They can have multiple equipment sets and um, they can equip weapons from the trading post and the black market, exactly the same as your leader there as well. The next type is a ganger. Now your gangers are the sort of um, the salt and bread of your gang. They are the, what you're going to have most of in your gang, composed of anyway. Um, they're gang fighters, they can't have special weapons, um, although you can take one specialist in most gangs which can take special weapons. There are some rules around certain gang types that do, do mean that you can take special weapons on your gangers, but it really does depend on which gang you're playing. They can also purchase advancements and can mul have multiple equipment sets as well. Um, the next type is a juve. Now juves are like the teenagers in your gang, they're the sort of up and coming ones, they've got a bit more character but they're not usually as good as gangers. Um, <clears throat> they can have multiple equipment sets too. They can equip pistols and close combat weapons typically and items from the trading post uh, and black market as well. They do not trigger nerf tests um, to friendly fighters within three inches when seriously injured or taken out of action as well. Um, that depends on the type of fighter again, but that's usually a prospect rule, that one. 
The last type of fighter that you're going to have in your gang is crew. And of course, crew are hired specifically for driving and operating your vehicles. They access the driver skills as primary. They must always have a vehicle, so you can't just have crew without a vehicle, and they can't appear without that vehicle. You can swap vehicles and you can equip pistols and trading post and black market items for your crew as well. And those are the different fighter types that you've got in your gang. Now for equipment. Any fighter can gain new equipment during a campaign, either from the house list or from the black market or trading post as well. Now we get into equipment sets though. Now some fighters can have multiple equipment sets, like I mentioned before, leaders and champions notably. Um, the most valuable equipment set is used when calculating the fighter's cost. A fighter can have the same piece of equipment in multiple equipment sets, so you can duplicate the types of um, equipment sets that you've got, but only one equipment set can be used for a battle. So if a battle uses random fighters, a fighter with multiple equipment sets will have one, se one set selected randomly as well. So you never get to choose if it's a random crew selection in that particular scenario. Fighters with weapons attached to the fighter can't have equipment sets, for example, orc metic weapons. Now, that really only applies for Ogrins, but we're not going to get into the specifics of that either. The next thing is gang hierarchy. So some fighters have the gang hierarchy ability, obviously leaders and champs mainly, um, but they can make post-battle actions. Um, only fighters that are part of a gang, and they get leading by example as well. Free skills. So some fighters start with specific skills or can choose a primary custom skill. This free skill is already included in the cost of that fighter. So your leaders and champs, like I mentioned, you get a primary skill for each of them that you can choose from their primary skill table. That does not increase the cost of the fighter. It comes for free. The next one is weapon restrictions. Most fighters have restrictions for what weapons they can be given. By default, each gang will specify what weapons are available to each fighter in the equipment list. Fighters can gain additional weapons from other sources, for example the trading post or black market. A fighter may have limits on what type of weapons they can have, whether they're pistols, basic weapons, special weapons, heavy weapons, etc. A fighter can have access to all weapon types, some or none, depending on the fighter type as well. So campaigns. So campaign play is the opposite to skirmish play. Skirmish play means that you're only playing one-off games that don't really count for anything, your fighters don't advance, you don't get anything for playing them other than just lots of fun. Sometimes skirmish games are really nice to play if you're new to Necromunda just to get a feel of the mechanics and obviously you know just have a bit of fun without having uh, the anxiety around losing your best fighters in the game. However, campaign play is really where Necromunda is best if you ask me and I think a lot of people would agree with that as well who've played Necromunda for quite some time. Now there are five different types of campaigns in total. Each campaign is based around gangs fighting battles to control resources pretty much most of the time. Each campaign type has a unique type of resource. A campaign typically includes a single type of resource. Most battles in the campaign are fought for control of a resource and the resource being fought over is at stake in the battle. And most battles have a resource at stake or the outcome of the battle usually has a resource at stake at some point in the campaign. Instead of fighting over a resource, the stake may be instead captives in some scenarios as well, um, held by the opponent gang too. So the next thing we're going to talk about are gang attributes. There are a few different types of gang attributes we've got here. The first one is gang rating. Now your gang rating is the total cost of all the fighters in the gang, including all their equipment and stuff. This is a little bit different to crew rating. You might hear me mention crew rating at some point. Crew rating is the total rating of um, a starting crew in a scenario. That, that differs quite a bit from your actual full gang rating. The next thing is reputation. You gain and lose reputation through a campaign, whether winning or losing, or from different boons from territories, etc. too. And next we've got wealth as well. So the gang wealth is the total cost of all fighters, credits and equipment in the stash too. So you can have weapons uh, and money in your stash as well. The next thing we're going to look about is alignment and allegiance as well. So campaigns can divide gangs into sides. Um, teams on the same side can still fight each other as well. Moving on now to the trading post and black market. Even if a campaign doesn't use the trading post or black market, they're optional and can be included in your campaigns as well. I suggest that you do use the trading post and black markets because it's going to add a lot of uh, extra flavor and color to your games. But if you are just starting out, you can always just start with your house lists. 
The next thing is campaign phases and cycles. So all campaigns are divided into three phases. This is the same through every single campaign type. Each phase lasts a number of cycles, which is an arbitrary amount of time that can be agreed upon by your campaign arbitrators. As you can see here, we've got a little um, table that I can show you for each of the campaigns and the types of um, things that are typical in those campaigns. So as you can see, Dominion, we've got a tick there for the trading post, but not for the black market. Likewise for Law and Misrule, we've got both there though as well. It then tells you which type of resources, uh, whether there are resources in it or not. In a Dominion campaign, which is the most typical campaign, you're fighting over territory. In Law and Misrule, you're fighting over rackets, which is similar to territory really in a lot of way, but they're, um, you know, business rackets. Um, for an uprising um, campaign, you're also dealing with territory as well, but there are a few other factors to bear in mind with uprising campaigns. In Outlander campaigns, these ones are really cool. You're actually fighting over structures and you're building structures um, and losing and gaining structures in your campaign to try and build like a, a base pretty much. And in Ash Wastes as well, you're gaining and losing road sections. The next thing of course is alignment and allegiance. It really does depend on the scenario type, but most of them are gonna have alignment and allegiance rolled into it. And then as you can see here, we've got phase one, phase two, and phase three, which differ slightly in terms of the um, type of campaign. But as you can see, phase two there, downtime is something that you have um, through all of the different campaign types as well. And then the rest of them are, you know, for phase one in Dominion, you've got occupation. For Law and Misrule, you've got expansion. Um, insurrection, development, and season of flame. These are all just names for similar types of things in the campaign. Challenges. So for Dominion and Law and Misrule campaigns, you can make challenges to your opponents to try and gain their terrain and their rackets. So any number of challenges may be issued. If declined, the stake is automatically claimed by the challenger. Worth noting that one. Challenges may be declined without pen penalty if the gang has received one or challenged this cycle. Um, and in the Ash Wastes, the gang has issued and received at least one challenge this cycle. Can use rescue missions to free captives instead of nominating a resource at stake for a battle as well. The winner of the challenge takes control of the resource or the racket at stake. If the result is a draw, the resource is not transferred, so it's not won at all by either side. Um, the defender tends to keep that. In an uprising campaign though, if the winner of the battle inflicted three times as many out of action results, as were suffered, not counting models that left the battlefield voluntarily or fled, then captives then capture a random resource from the opponent as well. Um, no resources change hands if the opponent only has the permanent resource remaining, like your settlement, which every single gang will get in a um, Dominion campaign or an uprising campaign. Now we're going to talk about the phases. Now, like I mentioned, there are three different phases, um, and it really does depend on the type of campaign that you're playing here, but the phase one for Dominion and Law and Misrule are pretty similar. Um, so each battle is rewarded by a single uncontrolled resource. The gangs decide which currently, currently available resources are at stake when issuing and accepting challenges as well. So you might, uh, your arbitrator will probably pull up a load of rackets and um, resources and territories and you can choose what you want to fight over from what's available. If there are no more uncontrolled resources, the phase ends and downtime begins. And then we move on to the second phase. But this does not change the length of downtime, but phase three can be extended if phase one ends early as well. In an uprising scenario, it's slightly different. Um, you earn resources and their rewards from the resources at the start of each cycle. Um, and each cycle, chaos gains ascendancy. Each gang must choose a territory to become ruined. In an Outlander campaign, this again is slightly different, you gain double the amount of materials from scenario rewards, and um, the following scenarios can't be used. Settlement raid, market mayhem, and stealth attack. But we're not gonna get into the scenario specifics right now. Phase two in a campaign, typically downtime. In fact, I think it's pretty much always downtime depending on the uh, type of campaign that you're playing. But as you can see here, I've got a little table that tells you what happens in downtime in each of the five different campaign types. The first thing that happens is fighters recover. So all your fighters that are in recovery or injured um, get out of recovery and they're not in the docks anymore. Two, captives are returned. So any captured fighters are released. The gang that had captured them receives half their credits value, rounding up to the nearest five credits. This is paid by friends and family, not the gang of the captured fighters that uh, they belong to. Third, experienced Jews are promoted. 
So Jews with 5 plus advancements are promoted to champions. This isn't that common to be honest for Jews. Their characteristics and credits value are unaffected, but their type is changed. From now on they're treated as champions in all respects. So they go straight from Jews to champions, they don't go from Jews to gangers. The next one is fresh recruitment. So this is where you get to recruit fighters in downtime. All the gangs gain 250 credits to recruit new fighters and or hangers on. These credits must be spent now and can't be added to the gang's stash. So you have to use you know, as much of those credits as you can on new fighters as well. Um, gangs may supplement these credits with extra credits from their stash if they wish as well, of course. Um, the last thing is settlement maintenance as well. So scrap 0 to 3 structures and gain half the material cost. Immediately build three new structures within normal requirements. Structures that are prerequisites for other structures cannot be scrapped as well. Of course, that's just for the Outlander campaign there as well. The next thing is side battles. So you can play side battles during downtime as well. Of course, you won't get any um, credits from your weekly sort of cycles from your territories and rackets and stuff, but you still will get experience and credits and whatnot from the actual scenarios that you're playing. Um, it's not like you just don't play at all during downtime. You can totally play during downtime. It's just that those battles that you are playing um, don't really count for as much. The final phase is phase three. Uh, in a Dominion and Law and Misrule campaign, Challengers nominate a resource currently controlled by the opponent and any number of battles may be fought in this phase. Remaining unclaimed resources. So depending on a campaign type, gangs may nominate unclaimed resources as the stake of the battle. Um, in an uprising campaign, all resources become ruined if not ruined already. Um, gangs can no longer um, re-equip from any house equipment list, recruit new fighters, hired guns or hangers on, Medical escorts to the dock um, cost D3 meat portions instead of credits as well. Meat something we're gonna is, is specific to um, the uprising campaign. It's a pretty cool mechanic, but we're not going to go into that in too much detail today. In Outlands scenarios, all scenarios can be used as well. Worth pointing out there. Ending a campaign. So after phase three, the campaign ends. There are a number of different triumphs depending on different campaign types. Um, a gang may earn more than one, but in a case of a tie, no one is awarded. New splinter gangs created based on the old gang gain bonuses for the next cycle. Um, triumphs only last for a single cycle. In Law and Misrule, the alignment that received most triumphs is declared to have tipped the balance, the balance of power between Law and Misrule, and they're basically the winner. Resources, territories, and rackets now. Each resource has a unique bonus. A gang receives the benefits of a resource so long as it holds it, including immediately after taking control in a battle. Once the resource is lost to another gang, the bonus is also lost as well. Resources are gained by winning a battle that holds one at stake. The only other way you can gain a resource is for um, exchanging captives, etc. Starting resources. So each gang starts with a resource which is permanent and can never be lost. In our campaigns, this is always a settlement. I suggest most arbitrators choose the settlement as the free resource that can never be lost for each gang um, because this one gives you bonuses for getting recruitment and stuff as well. Resource bonuses. All resources are unique and have different bonuses. Um, then we move on to income. So add the amount of credits to the stash when collecting income from resources, including any that was won from a previous battle. Recruits. Free to recruit and do not cost any credits. So you can gain free recruits from the settlement, I think is the only one that you can get it from. Um, this is the only way you're ever going to get free recruits. Of course, they do count towards your total gang rating as well, but they are free and don't cost any money. Um, but the cost is added to the gang rating and the wealth. Equipment must be purchased separately unless otherwise specified, unless they actually come with equipment, which is in most cases none. Hired guns remain with the gang while in control of the resource. Hangers-on can be recruited regardless of reputation and will not affect the maximum amount of hangers-on the gang may have. Equipment. Equipment can be distributed to el eligible fighters. Free equipment is lost when the resource is lost. So if you do have a resource that gives you equipment, um, that will be lost when the resource is lost as well. Purchased equipment is kept after the resource is lost. And the full cost is added to gang rating and wealth, even for discounted and free items. Reputation. Increase the reputation while in control of the resource. When the resource is lost, decrease reputation with the equal amount. 
and special as well. So if the resource is lost, so is the benefit. Enhanced bonuses. Some resources have enhanced bonuses that require specific criteria to be met in order to claim them. There are gang specific ones. Gang specific bonuses can only be claimed by the specified gang and it will replace generic bonuses of the same type. You then have linked bonuses. These are usually for either territories or rackets, but linked bonuses can be claimed by taking control of the specified resources. They are claimed in addition to any duplicate types of bonuses except income. Only a single income bonus can be claimed. Lastly, we have uprising territories. They provide two different sets of benefits for order or ruined. Only one of these sets are available at any time depending on the state of the territory. Once a resource has been ruined, it remains ruined for the rest of the campaign. Some benefits require certain rules to be in effect, like starvation, meat portions, and scavenging, scavenger rolls. If the rules are not in effect, the benefits are ignored. Home turf advantage and home ground. If this resource is at the stake of the battle, use either Zone Mortalis or Sector Mechanicus here. Um, but home turf advantage gives you the following. Bottle tests, you roll 2d6 and discard the highest, so you've got less chance of bottling out if it's your home turf. You also get plus one to your rally tests, and your hangers-on are included in your starting crew on a four plus. Um, that can sometimes be good, that can sometimes be really bad as well. It's worth mentioning quickly campaign events. Now, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the campaign events, but they can be used at the start of each cycle, and they affect the whole cycle, and you roll a d66 on a massive table to see what the campaign event is. These don't have to be included in campaigns. They can add another layer of complexity to a campaign, but I do suggest using them for a bit of extra flavor in your campaigns and your cycles. Outlander special rules. Now, Outlander campaigns are slightly different. Outlander campaigns have unique mechanics um, but we're going to talk about those just briefly, just skim over them a little bit. But instead of having, um, you know, um, territories and turf that you're fighting over, you're fighting over resources in Outlander campaigns. So resources are different in Outlander campaigns. The settlement is a collection of structures instead of just a settlement. All structures have a cost in materials and some have additional requirements that must be met. Some structures also provide materials and there are three types, power, sustenance and salvage. Structures provide one or two types of benefits, either materials collected once per cycle or other, always active. Materials can also be gained from scenario rewards as well. If the requirements for a structure are no longer met, the missing requirement must either be obtained or lose the structure. Gangs can build additional st structures in the post-battle sequence after receiving rewards. But we're not getting, getting into the specifics of those structures there at the moment. Ash Waste Special Rules. So, First of all, gangs are divided into two different types here. You've got outlaws and you've got raiders. You decide whether you're an outlaw or a raider. Fresh gangs can choose a side to join. However, ash waste nomads are always, always, always raiders, of course. The next thing is road sections. So the resources, road sections, are connected with other resources and or locations. The region, near, deep, or the wild wastes can affect battlefield surface conditions. The type, whether they're sanctioned or unsanctioned, indicates whether it's relatively safe or high risk reward. The next, the next thing you have are trading routes. So gain trading route bonuses when collecting income at the start of any cycle, if controlling the required resources to connect the specific locations. The next thing you have in Ash Wastes campaigns are battlefield environments. The following battlefield effects are in use, the battlefield surface, the seasons, the regions, the roads, and the visibility here. So the battlefield surface is the ground level of the battlefield, not including terrain, elevated air areas, and roads. This will affect any fighter on the ground unless on roads, elevated terrain, or otherwise protected by terrain. Next thing you have are seasons. The season depends on the phase and the cycle, otherwise randomized. But you'll either be in the season of flame, the season of ash, or changing seasons. The next thing is the region. So regions affect the battlefield surface, which in turn will affect fighters on the battlefield surface. The resource at stake will determine the region, otherwise randomized again. So it'll either be the near wastes, the deep wastes, or the wild wastes. The next thing we have are roads. So roads can be marked out or put on the battlefield surface. At least one road is recommended with the possible exceptions of a busy settlement or out in the deep wastes. Recommendations are one plus roads, six to eight inches wide, running from one battlefield edge to another. The last thing you have is visibility. 
Now visibility is not always as good as it is in the underhive. However, I can't imagine visibility being great in the underhive either with very limited lumens. But models cannot be targeted outside the amount of inches depending on what the visibility is for that. All weapons use long range accuracy regardless of the actual distance. It affects where terrain can be placed when coming into view, um, especially for rolling roads there. And any effects that ignore or modify pitch black also affect visibility. Perpetual campaigns. The phases of a single campaign can be looped where each loop is a full campaign. Games can simply continue without any modifications. Territories may be refreshed between campaigns. Each gang may retain one territory per 1000 gang rating. The rest of the territories are lost and a new set of territories are determined. In Dominion campaigns, you only add one random gang specific territory for each house from new gangs that join. The total number of territories is determined as usual, counting all gangs, new and old. Changing the campaign type. If the next campaign is a different type, discard all specific elements from the previous campaign. Maximum starting crew sizes. Additional crew size limits may be used in scenarios with the unlimited crew selection. Depending on your gang rating, you might get different maximum crew sizes. Lastly, going out in a blaze of glory. A gang with a gang rating above 4,000 or any other agreed upon limit can decide to either retire or go out in a blaze of glory. The gang takes part in the escape the hive scenario, which is a specific scenario for going out in a blaze of glory. The entirety of the gang is used, including hangers on. Any hired special characters and bounty hunters leave the gang and give no support to the gang, for example bounty hunters. Any leftover credits may be spent as usual and hired guns may be purchased for that scenario. Subplots and favours are another sort of mechanic that you can introduce to your campaigns if you wish. However, I'm not going to go into these in any detail at all here because I do think they add a bit too much complexity if you're beginning Necromunda and you're starting out in your first campaign. I'd probably avoid these, but they can add a lot of extra flavour to a campaign. So it's worth mentioning those there as well. Experience. This is uh, something that needs to be spoken about quite a bit because it's something that you're not gonna, you're not gonna experience, um, excuse the pun, in your um, skirmish games. This is something purely for campaign play here as well. So gaining experience is something that you get, particularly um, just for using campaigns. There are some standard ways of gaining experience. Scenarios can offer different ways, depending on the scenario type. Um, you might get plus one XP, for taking an enemy out of action, you might get plus 2 XP for taking a leader out of action, you'll get plus 1 XP for um, recovering from being broken, etc. There are different w ways that you can earn XP, and you can use that XP to either gain stat ups or s new skills in the game as well. Advancements Spend XP to gain advancements, update the fighter's advancements with one per purchase. The cost of each characteristics advancement of the same type taken is increased by 2 XP for each advancement of that type the fighter already has. Starting advancements. Note that leaders and champions start with one advancement as they have an initial skill, so you get that free primary skill for leaders and champions. This does not affect the gang rating again. Fast learners. Juves and special juves like prospects ignore the additional cost of advancements and always use the cost shown in the table regardless of the number of identical characteristic advancements they have up to the maximum. Promotions. Promotions are always optional. If a gang has a hard limit on a fighter class, no fighters can be promoted to that class until the gang has available slots. A fighter can keep any current equipment even if it breaks any restrictions of the gang fighter class but can only gain new equipment according to the new class restrictions. Access to the old skill set, if any, is replaced by access to the new skill set. And any special rules for the old class are lost and any special rules for the new class are gained. Juves and prospects can be promoted during downtime in phase two if having five plus advancements. Gangers gain advancements during the pre-match sequence if they have reached 6 XP. Reset XP to 0 each time you use those 6 XP and then roll 2d6 on the table to see what type of advancements they get. It's always random unless they are a specialist. Specialists, however, when becoming a ganger specialist, the fighter is a ganger for all rules purposes but spend experience and gain advancements in the same way as any other non-ganger, i.e. your champions, leaders and prospects. Maximum characteristics. Each stat has a maximum value. If a roll on the advancement table for a ganger has no option but to increase a characteristic beyond its maximum, treat it as a roll of 12 instead and instead become a specialist. 
here's the table for the maximum and minimum um, stat increases there as well, just for your perusal. Maximum stats also apply to vehicles as well, as you can see on the table here. Um, you can't go above those stats on a vehicle at all. Um, that's just the way it is. Skills. Skills can be obtained by the following fighters. Leaders, champions, including specialists, juves, including specialists, and gangers, but only specialist gangers. Skill access is divided into two types, either primary, which are quite easy to gain, or secondary skills, which are much harder to gain and cost more XP to gain them. To determine a random skill, declare a set and roll a d6 to see which skill is gained. Reroll if the fighter already has that skill or cannot take that skill. When gaining skills that are not random, simply choose one from the relevant set. The advancement table for leaders, specialists, um, juves, juves prospects and champions is as follows. For 3 XP you can spend, you can get plus 1 willpower or intelligence and that adds 5 credits to the fighter. For 4 XP you can get plus 1 cool or leadership stat and that costs 10 credits. For 5 XP you can get plus 1 initiative. For 5 XP you can get plus 1 movement. For 6 XP you can get plus 1 weapon skill or ballistic skill, that now costs 20 credits so it jumps quite a bit there. Um, for 6 XP you can also get one random primary skill as well. Um, for 6 XP, a Psyker will also gain one random weird power from any unique selection of weird powers too. Um, and for 7 XP, Delac leaders and champions promoted to Psyker can be an unsanctioned Psyker and gain one weird power as well. For 8 XP, you get plus one strength or toughness. This jumps to 30 credits. And for 9 XP, you get one custom primary skill. So you can choose a primary skill there. That's the 9 XP one. Um, that's what you're probably going to be aiming for on your leaders and champs most of the time. Um, that's the same for psychers, whether unique or universal as well. Um, the next one, of course, is um, one random secondary skill, which also costs 9 XP as well, but it is random, and it is your secondary skill table there as well. For 12 XP now, you get plus one wound or attack. Now, plus one wound or attack is very nice indeed. However, it does cost 45 credits on top of your gang fighter's total cost. For 12 XP, a specialist only can be promoted to a champion and gains one primary skill there as well. Um, that's the same for Psychers too. And for a whopping 15 XP, you can gain plus one skill from any set, but it has to be at random. And that's for plus 50 credits there as well. Now the advancement table for non-specialist gangers is quite different. It's always random and you can't choose what you're going to get. But here are the tables for the non-specialist gangers here. If you roll a 2 or a 12 on 2d6, you become a specialist. And that doesn't add any credits to you, but it does mean that you can level up like a leader or a champion instead. A 3 to 4, you gain plus 1 weapon skill or ballistic skill, and that's 20 credits. A 5 to 6 is plus 1 strength or toughness, and that's 30 credits. A 7 is plus 1 movement or initiative, and that's plus 10 credits. That's the most typical one to get on 2d6, I would say. An 8 to 9 is plus 1 willpower or intelligence, plus 5 credits. And a 10 to 11 is plus one call or leadership, which is 10 credits there as well. And that's the, the non-specialist ganger table there for you. Lasting injuries and damage now. So when going out of action, a model will suffer one of the following, depending on the type, whether it's a fighter, they will suffer a lasting injury roll. If they're chaotic at all, they'll suffer a mutation roll as well. For vehicles, they suffer crew lasting injury rolls and lasting damage as well on the actual vehicle itself. If an injury roll results in more than one out of action result, roll separately on the lasting injury tables for each. It's worth noting here that I think that's a bit harsh personally, so in our campaigns we only ever roll once on a lasting injury for any fighter because they're bad enough as it is. Going into recovery. When going into recovery, miss both the post battle sequence and the current battle and the next battle in order to recover. This means that leaders and champions going into recovery can't perform post-battle actions after the battle they receive the injury. No matter how many lasting injury rolls are made, the effect only applies once and does not stack. Characteristics penalties. A fighter can gain a decrease in a characteristic. This does not decrease the cost. Note that a decrease in a characteristic that is depicted as a target number actually increase this number. For example, if weapon skill 4 plus is decreased, it becomes weapon skill 5 plus minimum characteristics. So similar to your max maximum characteristics here, you can also have minimum characteristics. Um, for weapon skill and ballistic skill and initiative, the minimum is a 6 plus. For cool leadership, willpower and intelligence, the minimum is a 12 plus. And for strength, toughness, moves and wounds, the minimum is 1. 
vehicles, the toughness minimum is three on the front side and rear. The save is a minimum of six plus, and the handling is a minimum of 10 plus as well. Succumbing to injuries. Seriously injured fighters at the end of a battle survive without lasting injuries on a three plus. However, on a one to two, they succumb to their injuries and are treated as having gone out of action and suffer lasting injuries as normal. So let's have a look at those lasting injury tables now for the different types of fighters in the game. For a fighter suffering a lasting injury, on an 11, the lesson is learned and you gain three XP. You still go into recovery though. Out cold, you don't go into recovery and you don't get any lasting injuries there at all. 31 to 45 is grievous injury, which means that you, you miss the next game, technically. A 46 is humiliated, it's minus one cool and leadership, also into recovery. 51, a head injury, minus one intelligence and willpower, also into recovery. 52 is an eye injury, which is minus one ballistic skill. 53 is hand injury, which is minus one weapon skill. Hobbled is minus one movement there as well. 55, spinal injury is minus strength. The next one, enfeebled, is minus toughness. 61 to 65 is what you want to watch out for here. That's a critical injury. So you're dead if you're not treated by the doctor. If you don't have any cash to go to the doctor, that fighter is usually removed from the gang, which is a bit harsh. And if you roll a 66, um, if you're unfortunate enough to roll a 66, the fighter is dead and the attacker gains one XP for doing so. The lasting injuries for crew are slightly different here. Um, we've got um, 11 being lesson learned again with D3 XP, out cold, grievous injuries, humiliated, head injuries, eye injuries, critical injuries, and memorable deaths. But you don't get all the other stats that you have on crew to be able to actually mess with there as well. The lasting injuries for vehicles again are slightly different here. On a one, we've got persistent rattle, so plus one modifier on future rolls on this table. Two, we've got handling glitch, minus one to handling tests. Three is unreliable, roll a two plus per unreliable damage at the start of each battle or this vehicle can't take part. Four is a loss of power, which is minus one movement. Five is damaged bodywork, which is minus one toughness all around. Six is damaged frame, which is minus one wounds, which is quite harsh. And seven plus is a write off and they can't take part in any battles until repaired in the post battle sequence. Lastly, and this is the most fun one, this is for, for those chaotic fighters of yours that might gain mutations. Instead of gaining exactly the same as your lasting injuries table, you instead gain mutations instead. So um, for humiliated, you get hungering pride, which means must activate before other fighters in the crew. If other friendly fighters also have this mutation, choose the order and gain one XP for taking enemy leader or champions out of action. Pretty fun, that one. For a head injury, you've got Dark Madness, pass an intelligence test each activation, or roll a d6 to determine the first action. One or two is move, three to four is shoot or fight, and five to six, they don't do anything at all, they just stand around going, duh. 52 is eye injury, so that's bestial senses. Um, they can't start or take part in group activations, but they count as having a bio scanner. The next one is hand injury, and that's disturbing appendage. Um, count as a knife that can't be disarmed or destroyed and they add minus one to hit modifier when using unwieldy weapons whether with their weapon skill and ballistic skill 54 is hobbled which is warped limbs they're minus one movement but you roll 3d3 and choose the highest when charging instead of a single d3 the next one is spinal injury which is a crooked body add minus one to hit modifier to ranged attacks at long range and they can't wear armor of any kind equipped armor is returned to the stash the last one is enfeebled, which is twisted flesh. Remove one flesh wound at the start of each activation. They can't benefit from a bio boost, a Medicaid kit, or assistance from friendly fighters when making recovery tests. Critical injuries and memorable deaths still stand, but as you can see, mutations are actually quite favorable and really colorful and add a lot of flavor to the game as well. Being captured. If only one gang has fighters on the battlefield at the end of the battle, roll 2d6 and add modifiers. If you get a 13 or more, we're not going to go through those specific modifiers, but if you get a 13 or more, you've captured a fighter. Um, in a law and misrule campaign, though, you capture them on an 11 plus. If the result is higher than the capture level, one random fighter that went out of action is captured. Critically injured fighters can't be captured. Randomize another healthy fighter. A captured fighter is unav unavailable until freed. Hired guns can be sold without any rescue attempt as well. Anytime the same two gangs fight, the captured fighter's gang can declare a rescue mission, superseding any step to determine the scenario. If failed, this can be repeated in the next battle. 
If a gang fails to rescue the captive, or the gang doesn't want to rescue, the captured, capturing gang can choose any of the following. They can either trade them back to the gang, and they can just agree on how much that's going to be worth. They can sell them to the guilders. Um, you gain half the cost, rounded up to the nearest five credits by selling them. If you're a law-abiding gang, you claim a bounty on outlaw captives, gain the full cost, and an outlaw, um, you dispose of the captive as well. Um, it's worth noting that you can also um, use them for rituals if you're a chaos gang as well. Gangs can trade back captives at any time regardless of whether a rescue mission has already been attempted. The two gangs can try to negotiate a trade for the captive. This could be a payment of credits, a trade for another captive, a resource, any item, equipment or anything else. This is entirely up to the two gangs. And the capturing gang is free to refuse the offer. If an agreement is reached and the trade is made, the captured fighter is immediately handed over to the other gang. So I hope that video answers some questions about how to run a campaign, exactly what's involved in the different campaigns as well. I didn't go into the specifics of some of the actual nitty gritty details, but that should give you a good overview of how campaigns work, how you level up your fighters, how injuries work, captured, stuff like that. Um, so I hope this video is good for you newbies who are just about to start campaigns or haven't ever played a campaign before. Again, like I've said, Necromunda is best played in a campaign setting if you ask me. I think it's um, a much more um, deeply engaging and satisfying way of playing such a great game that is Necromunda. So again, please like, share, subscribe, and I will be back with another video real soon. Peace out.